All right, everybody, welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and today I have back with me Benjamin Claremont and Eugene Robin from Cove Street Capital. So, guys, welcome back to the show. Trey, Trey thanks for having us. We're excited to be back. Well, I couldn't wait to have you guys back on the show because last time you were here, which was about mid-December in 2020, we were talking about Lumen, which is one of your largest holdings. And back then it was trading somewhere around $10.5 a share. And then almost you know, shortly thereafter, it surged something like 50% up to 15 and a half or so dollars a share. And it's now drifted back somewhere around 13, I think. But I just had to catch up with you guys really quick before we get further along in this discussion. What are your thoughts about that surge? How are you guys feeling about the stock? Let's just touch on that really quick. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So when we spoke, um, Lumen had been under a fair amount of pressure. Um, we think, uh, I mean, there's no way to know for sure, but we think that it was kind of a victim of the end of your tax selling to some degree as people didn't have a whole lot of losses and Lumen was down. And so it got sold down pretty hard towards the end of the year. Um, and then, you know, I guess serendipitously, it got caught up in the GameStop kind of rush where people saw that it was heavily shorted and thought that maybe it could be the next GameStop. Um, it didn't end up being quite that. Um, and we actually sold a little bit above 16. Um, so we, and then, and then we promptly bought it right back. So thank you, Mr. Market and your irrationality for giving us that opportunity. But to, to be frank, some of the gap between what we perceive to be intrinsic value and the stock price has closed, but um, not nowhere near where, where you know, to, to make it anywhere near fair value. So um, there have been a number of fiber transactions that would be good comparisons for the uh, Lumen business side uh, slash level three, the old level three business. And they're suggestive of a much higher value for this company. And even a company like Cogent, which is a public company, trades at like 20 times EBITDA um, and has a very similar business model to the Lumen's business uh, services side. And, you know, it's 20 times for, for Cogent and five times for what all, every all of Lumen just doesn't make sense. To us, and 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 the act, and and the fact is, since we've spoken, um, Southeastern, which is one of the largest shareholders and has filed the 13D, has continued to push the company to highlight the value of its various assets. Um, one of the a sell side analysts reported that the company has hired bankers to look at selling the consumer business, which if you remember from our original podcast, that was one of our our, our premises is that they would separate these two businesses. So honestly, things are in motion. Um, I think people need to be patient, but they get paid to wait because the dividend yield is like, I think six, seven and a half or 8% still. So, you know, our conviction about Lumen um, really hasn't changed. And we continue to scratch our heads um, regarding the discount between comparable transactions and what we think the fiber's worth and what the stock trades at. So a lot to unpack there. First of all, you mentioned you guys sold a little bit, bought some back as it fluctuated, what net net, where do you guys kind of sit? Is it back to where you were and just took some money off the table or, you know, have you kind of de-risked a little bit more? No, I mean, it, we, I can just talk about the strategy that, that I co-managed where, where this, it's, it's our largest position. It, it, it went from, you know, a, a 10% position to a 15% position because of that. And so from a risk management perspective, I looked in the mirror and 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 talked to our, my co-manager, who was our, our our founder, about this. And and the question was, if it was a ten percent position at eight dollars, and it's a fifteen percent position and fifteen percent position at sixteen, you know, what is a proper risk management thing to do? And our perspective is, you know, you take some money off the table um, just to because if the, the the gap between intrinsic value had closed to so, to some degree. And so you take a little bit off to risk manage and then the stock promptly fell back. So it's still a 10% plus position. That kind of raises a, another question, which is, you know, as far as rebalancing, are, is 10% sort of the optimal range for you guys for any, any one holding? Um, this is an outlier. Um, it is, we look at this as a special situation. We think that the writing is on the wall that these, these assets are being separated. And, you know, the company has not come out and said so. Um, but everything we see points to that. So uh, I would say 
periodically, we will we are concentrated investors and we will take larger swings. Typically, our position sizes are two and a half, five, and seven and a half. Ten percent is the only, this is the largest position we've ever had. It speaks to our conviction. It speaks to the amount of work we've done. It ex, it speaks to our understanding of what's going on, you know, with management and inter, internally. Um, and so, it, could there be other ten percent positions in in the strategy's future? Absolutely. But I mean, I, I would say it's this is not quote unquote normal for us. This is a this is this is a big calculated, you know, very asymmetric bet in our in our mind. And people, you know, the company might be not talking about the split, as you mentioned, but CEO Jeff Story, I think, did come out on the investor call saying he listened to the podcast, I think, and said, you guys know what you're doing. <laughs> so alluded to the, the fact yeah. of our, our previous discussion, which was nice to hear. Yes. So um, what, I, what the IR person told me is that Jeff Story lis listened to our podcast and has listened to it many times, and he sends it around to people. And what he says to people... Uh, after, you know, when they listen to it, he said, these guys get it, right? And so if you just think about our premise, our premise is that the, that the consumer business and, and the, uh, the fiber heavy business services side never necessarily fit together. And Jeff Story, uh, when, he, when he originally sold the company to CenturyLink, um, always thought that it, there was an opportunity to sell the consumer business. And they looked at it in 2019, I think what they realized, and this was confirmed to me by, by the investor relations team, is that what they looked at it and they realized it, they didn't have anywhere near enough fiber in order to sell the consumer business. And so they've been investing aggressively in fiber since then. Um, and they've gotten profitability off, up a lot. Um, they've, they've extracted some synergies, but they haven't, they haven't done it in a way that, that, that you can't separate these businesses. And that was the important thing to, to learn is that they, they've always had an eye on um, having the opportunity to separate the consumer business. And, and if you look at the multiples that some of these consumer businesses have going, are going for, I mean, it is, it's way higher than the whole company trades for. Um, and we don't, you know, we don't even bake that into our numbers, but there's just, there's a lot of upside if they can separate these assets. And, and we think it's just, it's just a longer process than a lot of people have the patience for. And no one has a crystal ball. So let's be clear about that. But, you know, my, what I took away from our last discussion was, you know, the stock was around $10. It sounded like the stock could at least double pretty quickly. And then as you confirmed, I mean, it shot up 50% shortly thereafter. Um, since it's around $13 today, um, I guess it's only been a few months. So I'm guessing the assumption is that, you know, that's still the range to maybe consider is there's still a decent amount of upside I still had. Yeah. I mean, Eugene, you want to touch on what you think the upside is? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, we've dissected the business every which way you could possibly imagine. Um, luckily, they release a lot of financials for some of their subsidiaries like Quest and things that they issued debt for. So publicly traded debt usually files, not usually, always files SEC, um, you know, financials. So we can kind of dissect out parts of their business. So whether you want to apply um, a, a, a I guess, private market multiples to the business services side, which is the fiber. Um, it's more like cogent, um, uh, like an alternative to cogent or, you know, competitor to Colt, which is another big uh, firm out in Europe. So if you do it that way, I mean, you could get the value of the company and, and then some just for the business services side, if you apply just like a private market a multiple, um, Ben alluded to the fact that there have been, you know, many transactions in the fiber space. And I just encourage anyone just to take the business services EBITDA and apply whatever you feel is a, is a you know, is a fair uh, private market value. Um, you can even take a discount to it if you really want to be conservative. And you'll see that you, you're looking at somewhere in the 20s as a uh, value for the entire company. And that's with valuing the legacy side, which everyone, you know, kind of hates at four times, which yeah, I think we have a saying here at Cove, any, every, anything in the world is worth four times. It doesn't matter what it is, even if there's a secular problem. So um, I think that's one way to look at it. You can look at it just uh, going the other way. It's like, okay, well, uh, if you look at what Frontier sold some of their assets for, or some of the more rural uh former Celex and Ilex, um, like Alaska or uh, parts of Cincinnati Bell went for, again, 
it just it's incredible it's incredible that this company is valued where it is uh again it's just i think uh, people don't like um buying the good with the bad and they just apply the the bad moniker and paint the good with the same paintbrush and i think that's really the opportunity and I, you know i i would discourage anyone from investing this way if there is no catalyst but in this case uh because i you know unlocking that value is it's a, it's a it's an arbitrary process when it comes to like timing but in this case we think that our, our research indicates that um there is a catalyst and i can't tell you if it's tomorrow or a year from now, but it's coming. Um, it, it's it's evident from all the pressure that they faced from you know various investors, including Southeastern. Uh, I we believe that you know that value will be kind of uh, illuminated. Pun intended, right? Um, exactly. So, um, for those who are new to this discussion, I encourage you to go back to our episode number three twenty six, where we really go deep on Lumen, and you can kind of get a feel for the company that way. And, uh, you know, learn a lot more about the opportunity at hand, but we had to touch on it, right? Because the performance was just stellar right after that and looks to have dropped that back down to another kind of interesting buy point potentially, um, something at the end of our discussion was really interesting because somehow we brought up via sat, which is another one of your largest positions, I believe. And we started just talking about it casually and how Elon and Starlink have kind of entered the space as a competitor to Viasat. Now, I'm a longtime fanboy of Elon Musk, and I follow his companies pretty closely. And he seems to have this unstoppable advantage in the race for space domination. You know, given his fleet of reusable rockets that he can launch at will for a discount. And he's now introduced Starlink, right? Which is this constellation of satellites to beam down broadband all over the world. And they already have hundreds of satellites in orbit. So from my outside perspective, it appears that he's only a short time away from producing billions of dollars worth of new revenue through this internet service. So why am I saying all of this? Well, basically because you guys hinted that the fact that Viasat, which is the stock that we are spotlighting today, is a vastly superior company to SpaceX and Starlink in this initiative. And that really caught my ear. And I've been wanting to learn more about it ever since. Now, I wish I had kind of listened to you at the time when you mentioned that because it was trading around $30 a share and it's now shot up to 60 and floated, drifted back down to about 50s as of today, the low 50s. But I want to definitely spotlight this stock because I think that's news to a lot of people who are very familiar with the Elon Musk PR machine and maybe have only really heard about Starlink. So let's start. Let's take the opportunity to learn about Viasat. And i just like to start with a quick overview of Viasat and how it makes money. Let's start there. So, so I'm going to give a spoiler, immediate spoiler alert, and then I'm going to pass it to Eugene to answer the, like the, the, really the meat of your question. Um, Starlink and e is done, has done incredible things with their launch technology. Um, and, and so, so SpaceX has done incredible things with the launch technology. And Starlink has um, a pole position to be really successful in a lot of rural broadband applications. Um, but um, the truth of the matter is, in five, three to five years, Biosat is going to be an in-flight Wi-Fi and military connectivity focused company. Rural broadband will be a competitive market where Biosat will have assets that can compete, not necessarily with fiber, but with whatever, whatever Starlink offers. And it will be a competitive market, just like you know DSL was, just like if you're in Los Angeles and there are three or four different fiber providers that you can touch, it will be competitive. But the success of Viasat over the next three to five years will be based on their ability to penetrate in-flight Wi-Fi globally and offer connectivity to the military that does not exist today, expanding the total addressable market well beyond what other people are even considering now. Um, and now I'll hand it to Eugene. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, so I, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I I do not want to uh, for people to think that in any way we believe you know Starlink is an inferior product uh, to to Viasat's uh, current Exceed product. I just I just 
want to say that and, and, and also preface what I'm going to say with the following that I, I believe uh, uh, Elon will be the only person that's successful within Leo, um, barring, you know, Bezos throwing $20 billion at the problem. Because obviously, if you have unlimited, you know, checkbook, I think you could do whatever you want, really, um, irrespective. Leo, Leo meaning lower Earth orbit, right? I just want to spell that out for people as well. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I try to avoid acronyms. Uh, yes, a uh, low Earth orbit. So, you know, Jeff Bezos is also kind of in the game with Kuiper. That's his constellation. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, he, I, I, you know, if you really want to talk about advantages, I think he probably has the best one, which is money. He, it's almost an infinite, you know, he, it's a rounding error for him, really, um, as opposed to Musk, as well as, uh, you know, Biasad. So uh, I just I just want to say that up front, like I I really do believe that they will be successful. I think that he's already successful. Let's put it that way. Um, and you know they'll be a part of the pie that's controlled by the uh, Leo low Earth orbit operators, and they'll be a part of the pie that's controlled by the geo or geostationary satellite operators like Viasat. And you know that's really how you have to think about it. I, it's unfortunate, but people think this is like a zero sum game where, uh, you know, the, there's going to be a winner takes all sort of thing where, you know, uh, Elon's kind of advanced uh, state space cap capabilities allow him to win the entire pie. That's just not, it's just, it's impossible for many, many, many reasons, uh, which I'll kind of touch on. But to answer the question I think you posed initially, which was how does Viasat make money? I kind of want to rewind the clock a little bit, and uh, I, I will I will give the disclaimer that once upon a time I had a real job and I was a software engineer, uh, and I actually worked at Viasat when I graduated from uh, from school. So when I when I was there, um, the the part of the business that I worked in was the network systems group, and the actual core of Viasat from its founding has been within uh, encryption and decryption technology specifically for the military. So this isn't a company that, you know, all of a sudden woke up and said, hey, you know what we should do is uh, get into uh, military applications. They've always been there. That's been the core money maker from day one. They've actually been the uh, displacer in that space. Uh, Mark Dankberg created a, you know, a, a more advanced and niche product set within encryption and decryption specifically for inline network communications for the military. And slowly over time, they became, you know, they went from startup to a uh, disruptor to now a dominant uh, player within that space for the DOD. So that's actually how the core of how they make money is that defense side. And then naturally, uh, most people, when they look at the company, because all the glitz and glamour and, you know, headlines and all that is specifically on the residential broadband, they skirt over this, what we consider to be a, a, a diamond in the rough or the true jewel, which is the defense side. And it's due to the defense side's high cash flow generative capabilities, uh, Vice has been able to develop everything else that they have. So that's actually the core of how they make money. Now, um, you know, in conjunction to that, what they have is really a, a, a communications equipment business, which they sell uh, ground network equipment to uh, other satellite providers, actually. Uh, and so that's the one thing that's really interesting because I think space tech is, is in this really interesting revolutionary kind of uh, flowering point where, you know, we're actually in El Segundo and behind me, there's uh, probably uh, three dozen startups right now and you know all the large defense contractors that are in space so um you know kind of at the, we're at the in the epicenter of it and and as more and more money flows to it and Viasat will actually benefit on the communication equipment side because most people don't have the 25 year track record of building space uh, reliable uh, equipment that Viasat does whether that be the antennas or the ground station uh, networking equipment or uh, some of the, uh, the more uh, nuanced things that go into satellites. So that's one of the ways that they also make money. And then the other one obviously is the, uh, let's call it the satellite service society, which is, I think, you know, where most people are kind of fixated on. So that's the residential broadband. Um, they do that through their exceed service, or I don't know if they still call that, let's call it that anymore, but, um, and then they have in-flight Wi-Fi. So if you're ever flown on JetBlue or American, that's uh, that's actually all powered by Viasat. It used to be powered by a company called GoGo, which 
again, if anyone's ever flown and used GoGo, it's, it's one of the worst services I've ever imagined. Um, and, and then, so the device had displaced them. Uh, and in fact, I think it's, I think it's public now. So Delta uh, officially signed on to have their entire fleet be switched over to Viasat uh, through 2022, I believe. Um, anyway, so they have in-flight Wi-Fi, then they have, um, they call it community Wi-Fi, but it's, it's, it's actually, it's a really interesting little niche business that they don't talk about as much. But um, if you go to Mexico or parts of Brazil now, they actually have um, basically these waypoints that uh, they put in, in rural, very poor areas that they can beam down satellite connectivity to. And from that waypoint, it actually uh, it distributes that connectivity to uh, uh, folks that can maybe pay a dollar a day roughly for, for you know, internet access. So it, they actually provide a, a, a scaled, uh, cheap connectivity solution for folks that cannot get connectivity around the world. Uh, and then lastly, you know, due to their acquisition of, of RigNet, they'll have a maritime business, which is um, both offshore oil derricks, uh, they have, you know, um, tankers, uh, cruise liners, things like that all need connectivity. Uh, so, you know, uh, when you're out in the middle of the ocean, obviously you're far away from any sort of uh, wireless connectivity capabilities uh, and you need you know, people now want to be connected all the time. So, you know, bias that will be that bridge. So that's kind of like the, I'm trying to go quickly over it, but the, that's the satellite services side. So those are like the three, I guess, legs of how Viasa truly makes money. So let's talk about those legs because, you know, Viasat's revenues are only a couple of billion dollars right now, but it seems like the satellite industry globally and connectivity and some of these other industries you mentioned that they're playing in, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars, right? So as far as market share goes, how do they kind of fit into the landscape? What, what would you say? Are they, you know, are they dominating on the, obviously on the US government space? Do they have sort of a uh, monopoly on that business? Like, ha- just give us an idea of like their position in the space overall. Sure. So I'll start with the government system side. So if you look at their government revenue, they have about, let's call it, I'm just rounding up. Uh, 1.1 billion in total revenue. Most of that, uh, maybe 75% of it, is on products. So that's kind of the things that I described in the network encryptors, the handheld portable radios go to individual special operations units. There's uh, um, the high end uh, encryption modems that go you get installed in like Blackhawks and F-18s and things like that. So that that's the core of uh, of the, the product set within the government services, and they have. What they consider to be the service line, that's um, while that's a catch-all, the vast majority of that is actually uh, the connectivity side that they use their current satellite systems um, and also partner with others uh, and resell to the government. So that is about two hundred, call it two hundred seventy-five million. So tiny. And if you, if anyone's interested, the GAO put out a, a report at the end of twenty nineteen about uh, you know the future. Uh, you know, military DOD use of commercial SATCOM uh, versus kind of building it inside and what, what should they do within that report? I believe the number is, um, let's say, 4 billion is what the DOD spends on uh, paying other commercial providers for satellite connectivity. So, by that, 275 million, the addressable market just for America's DOD. I'm not even talking about the UK or Australia or anyone else within our NATO complex. It's four billion. Uh, needless to say, there's a large runway from where they are today to where they can be. Uh, in case of people are kind of curious, like, okay, well, what does that actually mean? What is a, a what is a, a connectivity service provider actually do for the DoD? Well, by that specific line item is actually Air Force One, and Air Force Two. So they power uh, our presidents uh, when they fly around in Air Force One. Uh, they power the actual connectivity uh, and encrypted, you know, uh, hardened connectivity that goes into uh, State Department airplanes. That's one of their biggest contracts. They also do uh, uh, special operations uh, connectivity to SOCOM. And I, obviously I, I don't know specifically what that entails for obvious reasons, um, but they uh, either use their current satellites or most likely given where special operations 
books operate. Um, they'll act, they'll actually uh, buy uh, or resell effectively connectivity from um, an Intel SAT or in Marsat or SES, which are uh, what I consider to be traditional mainline, um, you know, uh, distributors of satellite connectivity around the world. And why that's important is because so YSAT is trying to build a global constellation with their Viasat 3 constellation. Uh, every time they, they cover a new part of the world, it actually opens up the opportunity to sell that connectivity to their defense partners. And as I just outlined for you, if let's say the market is $4 billion just from the United States, uh, our own DOD uses, uh, you can imagine that um, if Viasat has the contract to deliver connectivity because they happen to have the um, the uh, the hardware that's doing it for uh, uh, the part, that part of the military right now, they can just basically redirect connectivity to their own satellite. And now instead of paying uh, for kind of reselling someone else's revenue, they'll get that all coming to them. So, uh, you know, that that's, I think, if you want to talk about um, the markets that operate, that's kind of the military side. Then if you go to uh, connectivity services for broadband. So broadband, I mean, in the US, there's probably, if you aggregate Hughes, which is the other main competitor to Viasat right now, um, and Viasat together, you're looking at somewhere around 2 million users. I mean, I'm just rounding. Uh, so there's 2 million satellite connectivity, uh, satellites, uh, internet users. Um, Elon believes that that market, not only that market, it could be his, which I, I totally understand and agree with, but also, um, you know, on the periphery of DSL, you know, what, what's really DSL? Like people you know, use that term a lot, but um, the way that the government defines what's high speed DSL is basically only 25 megabits per second download speeds. Most of us here in LA probably have somewhere around 100. So you can, you know, the, the point is the actual true addressable market for high speed connectivity for internet via satellite can actually be much greater. And I actually think that's, that's one of the things that SpaceX truly gets where it's not just about, hey, I'm in middle of nowhere, North Dakota, and I really need to connect, and I'd like to connect in, on a fast way to the internet, but also they can pick off people on the periphery of larger cities and things like that. Well, so, I think I've heard, to that point, I think I've heard Glenn Shotwell, the COO at you know SpaceX, say that the that industry is trillions, potentially, of dollars. Do you agree with that, as far as like the TAM? Yeah, I think um, either her or... Uh, the uh, CEO, I'm looking at his name of Telesat. I think he threw out 600 billion. I think the the point is it it the pie is so massive that if Leo is successful, that doesn't mean that Geo won't be okay. And I think that that's really what people misunderstand here. So they like, they treat Biasat as some sort of weird short to the success of Elon. And I I, I we fundamentally disagree. And again, we'll run over, run across some of the reasons why, but um, so, but yes, I mean, if you think of TAM for broadband connectivity as anyone who has subpar connectivity, that extends to a lot of people who are even in populated centers. And I think that's actually why Elon is building what he's building. He's not building it. He's going to start out with the rural because that's the proof point, right? And that's the easiest thing to say, like, hey, look, you know, it, it's working and these people are, are, are hungry and starved for this connectivity. But I think his overall goal is going to is going to have to be if he really wants to make this economic to go after some of the DSL users that are actually CenturyLink probably uh, users and whatnot. So you mentioned geo. So that's geostationary, right? Uh, okay. And so talk us through a little bit, because look, it's easy to kind of get a quick sense that Viasat has been around for a very long time. And a lot of people's eyes, it could be seen as, I don't know, a dinosaur, if I'm, you know, at, in the worst case, right? Where you, compared to something like a SpaceX with reusable rockets that are launching these things up, is it, is there, I just want to, let's walk the listeners through why the disruption of Viasat might be very hard for something like a SpaceX or, you know, especially given the geo element. Sure. Um, well, that's a, it's a great point that you made about, uh, Viasat being a dinosaur. And so uh, let me just start there. 
in 2011 and 12, when Biosat One, which is their was their first satellite that they built themselves, and uh, well, with partners, but uh, the one the first one that they launched, those high, you know, provide a high throughput connectivity. Um, the actual term of high throughput satellites didn't exist. Biosat was in and of itself a disruptor of the geostationary business because the typical geo satellite providers like SES, Intelsat, and Marsat didn't actually make anything themselves. They relied on Boeing space systems or Laurel space systems to do the design. And there was, because no one had pushed the envelope, everyone just kind of coasted on, you know, uh, a 1980s-esque technology. So Mark Dangberg came along and said, you know what, we can do better. And I think that there's a use case. This is, it was more of like a field of dreams moment where, you know, if you build it, they will come sort of thing. So, you know, to him, he correctly surmised that if you built a higher throughput connectivity solution, given the fact that our society had already advanced to the point where everyone had these magic phones in their hands or really powerful and, and everyone's always connected. Well, if you built that connectivity, you would find willing takers for it. So Viasat One was actually the, revolutionary kind of Starlink of this day, right? And no one believed that he could do it, and yet he did. Uh, so when he said, okay, well, we're not, not going to stop there. Viasat 2 will be, you know, say um, double or triple the capability of Viasat 1. Again, people said, no way, that's impossible. It's not going to happen. And sure enough, he did it. He delivered. Um, Viasat isn't a dinosaur. It's actually on the, specifically on geo. It's on the leading edge of geo. And, and in fact, if Mark is correct about the, um, let's say the fourth generation, because he's already said things like eight terabytes per satellite, it will be the equivalent of every one satellite currently in existence um, in geo or being planned times, I must say four. Just think about that one generation four satellite will be that. So the, my, the point is, Viasat continues to iterate and develop and leap ahead of all the competition that they have in geo. I personally, you know, this is our premise that if if geo was left alone and had no Leo competition, Viasat actually would eventually dominate and own ninety nine percent of it. Would be, Unless, you know, so we had some natural champions that were uh, kept around just because, you know, France, France wanted to have their own or whatnot. But it, the, the technological progression there was such that um, they, were, they were starting to get to an inflection point of just opening up a wider and wider, uh, I guess, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, advantage versus their competitors. So, um, so let's, let's put it that way, right? Uh, now, now, when you talk about comparing that to what Elon's doing with Leo. Um, so one, you know, people need to understand the true difference between geostationary and low earth orbit is the low earth orbit side of Leo means that they're at like, you know, let's say 550 kilometers above the earth, which means that the just physics, right? The speed of light travels a certain amount of time. And so you can get 25 millisecond um, uh, latency. Um, so just, you know, how fast it takes your uplink and then for it to hit the satellite and come back down as a downlink. So geostationary is much, 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 much higher up in space. And so that means that the average ping or the, uh, the average uh, latency becomes somewhere around, you know, four to 600 milliseconds, massively different. Is that really important though? It is if you're a Twitch streamer or a gamer or a heavy Zoom user. So I, if we were doing Zoom over um, Viasat service, we'd obviously have a lag and a delay, which is obviously is annoying. You could you could do it, but you would you know you'd have to pause and for a split second, and people don't like that. So uh, there is a a more uh, you know advanced use case for Leo that you know a Geo just cannot hurdle over right now. And it will, it will never do so, but just because, again, physics being what it is, it is what it is, right? So I think that's really, if we talk about the differentiators of Leo service versus Geo, that's what it comes down to. It's whether or not you're doing live uh, video streaming. 
Um, if you're not, if you're just consuming bandwidth when it comes to browsing it around the internet or um, you know bringing up Netflix movies, whatever, YouTube, it doesn't matter. It really, I mean, it's it's indiscernible in, in the way that they've kind of optimized the way that they cache things down at the, the modem level. It, it It's not a big deal. Um, so, so in I, other, sorry, just to, not to cut you off, but in other words, so I understand correctly Starlink is very focused on the, the lower Earth orbit or the LEO side of the business. Viasat has a lot of assets on the geostationary side of the business. Not that they don't have LEO as well, but they're primarily focused on geo. And is that harder to disrupt? So they do not have a LEO connectivity solution um, that's uh, consumer or business facing. They actually have a, a trial with the Air Force building uh, LEO satellites for a, you know, maybe an, uh, a military, military constellation, um, but they do not have anything on the LEO side. They have, a, they've been okay to, I think there's a plan, I think they have a 430 or something like that uh, satellite constellation that they could launch themselves, um, but they have historically claim that it, it, it doesn't make economic sense for them to do so. Their main reason why is because, uh, so the ge geostationary is a singular satellite, right? There, there's not there's like a thousand of them. There's just one, uh, Viasat has two. Um, and eventually they'll maybe have like between six and 10. Um, so that one satellite though can take its beams and um, it, it's, it's uh, just think of them as like spotlights and divide them up into many, many, many other tiny beams and then steer it. And this is the thing that um, you know, Mark pioneered, uh, steer that beam into the highest bandwidth um, kind of the demand area that, that, they, that they have, which means that one satellite can effectively, if you sell it correctly, utilize you know, 90 to 95% of its overall capacity, okay? Right, so you have, you know, it's sitting up top, it doesn't move. It just says, okay, there's more demand over here. So I just steer the beam that way. Leo uh, by its design is actually, a, you know, a, a, uh, their, their satellites are much smaller. Um, they're speeding across the sky, never ending, always, you know, orbiting the earth or orbiting the earth. And so the, like the, if you think about the flight path of a Leo satellite, most of the time it spends over uh, um, uninhabited parts of the world. The, our world's 70% water. So it's beaming satellite connectivity to absolutely no one. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I, this is actually the interesting point too that I wanna make. So we can get into like the more technical aspects of what uh, Elon has to hurdle over. But one of them being, if you're, Le if you're a Leo connectivity provider and you're trying to, let's say, provide connectivity to a plane or a ship in, in the middle of the Pacific, you can't. Even if you're over them, the reason why is because there's no way for you uh, to beam the, the request by the user on the, on the ground or in the air in this case, uh, back down to earth and into the actual internet without having something called base stations. So in the middle of the Pacific, you can't have a base station because, well, there's nothing, there's no fiber, there's no, I mean, you can, you know, it's, it's impossible for you to connect. So how, how do the airplanes then going over the ocean have Wi-Fi coming down, obviously from satellite with Viasat, how are they yeah. getting the... Right, so the, so because Geo, just think of Geo as, the, again, like a, a big flashlight, right? It's shining on this part of the earth. Well, that flashlight also sees base stations as opposed to Leo, which is much, much you know, um, closer to the ground. And so it, it's view angle is constrained to, you know, um, I don't, I'm just, again, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the specific sign of, uh, of, of uh, Starlink this well, but let's say it's constrained to like a 50 square mile radius, right? If you don't, if it doesn't see a base station within its, you know, view angle, then it can't actually communicate with the internet, right? Got it. Got it. So, so so on that point, how much in your estimation does SpaceX truly pose a risk to Viasat? It sounds like, you know, they are going to really take over this rural 
a uh, total addressable market, if you will, uh, for people who aren't connected to the internet. And you guys seem okay with that, right? That doesn't seem to encroach on Viasat's turf that much. Um, I'm wondering, does SpaceX and Viasat actually benefit from each other in any way in this regard? So uh, a couple of things. One, I actually don't think that he's going to win the, I said 2 million yeah, rural users. I actually don't think he's going to get to 2 million. I think um, probably 400,000 is what he's capable of really serving really well. If he, if he sticks to the 100 megabit per second download speeds um, and unlimited uh, actual capacity, which I have a high, I don't think he'll, he'll do that. I think he'll actually amend the plans if it gets really successful um, and like, they'll degrade the service. But anyway, uh, how many satellites would that take also? Because he's talking about hundreds of satellites. Four, going into space. I think 4,400 that he's now okay to do at about 550 kilometers um, will allow him to do about 400,000 to maybe maybe 500,000 uh, users um, in, in, a, in a you know quality service, right? And uh, I just want to have people understand. So because uh, the satellite is what it is, right? It's, it's, you know, fiber, you can have multiplexers that you can swap out and you can take one strand and then subdivide it into a thousand strands. And it's all done by both software and also hardware on the ground. Um, and, and, and it's re it's very like uh, adaptive meaning, like you could swap equipment out every month if you want, right? Uh, Leo satellites, you can't do that with. So once you launch them up there, to refresh the entire system would take you a year to three years, right? So um, think of the satellite as like a fixed amount of bandwidth and you can take that bandwidth and slice it up and dice it up among a, a bunch of these users, but then you have to start making trade-offs between uh, um, um, capacity and and actual speed. So if you if you're not, like right now he's serving uh, 10,000 or 40,000 users and uh, people love it, if you, 10x that can you have the same quality of service maybe if you go 20x that i don't think you can just it's it's physics right i mean there's a certain amount of capacity that you, he has to use he can divide it up among all the users if there are too many users then he has to degrade the quality of the service it's kind of like our cell phone towers right if, you, if there's 10,000 people connected to one tower it's going to be like you're on 2g so. so it's the opposite of a network effect in that regard, right? It's ironically given yes. the name, but it's like the more people using it, the less. That's exactly right. Which is why, you know, Elon has said like, hey, I'm going to, I want to get to 40,000 satellites. And why does he say that? It's not, he's not saying it for like, you know, just for, uh, for fun. It, he actually needs to have the density of the, those, those uh, satellites in order to provide more, the same service to more and more people. And uh, because again, at any given point in time, if you're going to be a Starlink user, you're going to be maybe seeing two, maybe four satellites above you, right? And each of those satellites is small. And technically, you know, if you really want to get down to it, can serve maybe 500 people. So if you're in a rural area in Iowa with 20,000 uh, uh, people who really want connectivity, I actually, physically speaking, he can't capture hundred percent of the market. I hope that makes sense. Like he, he'll, he'll, he'll do really, really well, but if he wants to get hundred percent of the market, he's going to have to degrade everyone else's uh, connectivity, which would then make it be on par with, um, you know, or even worse than like what Hughes or Biasite can provide. So there, there's a limit to how much he can win, which goes back to our point, which is not a winner takes all pie. It's going to be Elon and, and, and Starling have, you know, this nice slice, Viasat has this slice, Hughes has this slice and declining, um, it, but they're, they're all, they're going to win in some way, right? And, and going, I think you also asked, like, can they help each other? There are, there are network effects in the sense that he's actually, his promotion machine is so great because he's, he's advertising for satellite connectivity in general. And what is that going to do for providers like Viasat who can, um, let's say they can, you know, uh, subtuple the quality of their service over the next three years, but just by providing more and more bandwidth, I think they'll be able to ride on the coattails of, you know, this great PR machine that Starlink has and saying, hey, you know, if you want hundred megabits per second, we could also do that. And let's say that we don't, we're not going to charge you $500 for the equipment. We're going to charge you 25 or 50. Maybe even give it to you for free. So that I'm saying that there is, there are 
uh, helpful of things that come along with Elon being who he is and a great salesman. Okay. So as well as a race to space, are we talking about a race to the bottom as well? Meaning that all this capacity coming from space in the near future, does that just like crush the price of internet? I mean, are we going to be paying any uh, pennies for connectivity and the, does that actually have a negative effect on these companies revenue streams it's a great 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 question think of it this way i don't think the price of internet have you paid more for your internet since 1998 i don't think so i think most people have paid between 50 and 120 dollars for the longest time ever and you can you know they'll run promotions you'll threaten to switch over from spectrum to dish or whatever but in the end the price has been relatively the same what's actually changed and plummeted is the price per bit delivered and that's the key here so when you think about who's going to win in the future, it's going to be the person with the lowest price per bit because in the end, connectivity is a commodity. It's, there's, you don't care as a consumer, whether you're the military, well, maybe, no, I should caveat that, maybe- well, Encryption, people, right? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, right. But, but let's say, let's say you're, you're, you're a maritime consumer or you're a, a backhaul consumer or you're just a regular you know, a consumer at your house. Like you don't care really who it is. You just want good service you want the most of it and you want it for the cheapest price possible. It's very simple. So what does that mean? That means that um, the, the, the folks in the satellite space with the lowest cost per bit are going to be the dominant players. And I, again, if you think about the overall capacity as you see this pie, your overall share of the revenue attached to that capacity will be your equivalent share of the capacity pie, right? I mean, if you're selling a commodity and there's really no differentiation, a bit is a bit, then your share of that pie will be dependent upon how good is your actual space tech. And so I think this is exactly why we believe that Biosat will provide a larger than current slice of the pie in the future. And also, I really do think that Musk and, and Starlink are correct. That pie will grow. And the more and more capacity and connectivity that there is up in the sky, more and more use cases will show up. And then you'll start seeing crazy stuff like, oh, sensors around, you know, I, again, I'm just making things, things up like, um, instead of building a wall, why don't we actually employ sensors for, for border well, security? Or, or like does that. it, does the Starlink have a, you know, a vertical almost integration with Tesla vehicles that are obviously getting connectivity on the highways and stuff? Is that part of the benefit? And, and is there like a, almost like a, uh, you know, um, longitudinal, like, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say is basically, is there, is there an advantage that is going to benefit Tesla in some way from having yeah. these satellites in space? It's funny. Um, I believe that, uh, Starlink, uh, had, has told its users and beta users to not, please do not take the satellite dish and drive around with it on, on top of your truck or whatever your Tesla, or we'll actually turn it off and take it from you. Um, but that's ending, I'm going to say in June. I, don't, I think they put something out where they're, they're going to allow their users to be mobile. Because I think, again, one of the sneaky things that he's going to do is I think he's, he will integrate the service in some way. I think that's how he thinks um, with Tesla. And it will be kind of like a, the, the, I don't know, like the serious sort of, hey, I, I bought this car. It has serious radio already pre-installed. It'll be, hey, I bought this Tesla. I already has Starlink pre-installed. So, Meaning, uh, like now you've got your full self driving on the highway, and now you've got Netflix streaming on your car perfectly. Exactly, yeah. and again, one I think one of the limiters to uh, tr truly having autonomous vehicles is connectivity and sensors. And so, um, you know, if you're out in the middle of Arizona, your 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 car needs to have some sort of waypoints that are pre-programmed and, and downloaded onto it, and are, are, are adaptive. And I think the connectivity will. If you have a higher throughput connectivity solution, I think that will enable things like that. Like, like I said, there, there, I, there's things that uh, higher end connectivity through space that we haven't even thought of that will mm. appear. And I think that's uh, I know the, really the long term business case for for Starlink and Elon too. So, speaking of Tesla, Ben, you know Tesla seems to be holding the crown for like the major 
ESG company on the public markets right now. But I've heard you say that Viasat is the ultimate ESG company. And I would love to know why. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I've said that a little bit facetiously, but think about this way. So how many years ago did Google with their loon program where they're putting hot air balloons up in the air and trying to beam connectivity to poor areas where that that weren't connected or Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook saying that he was going to connect the world's poor and, you know, Elon talking about it as well. Biaset is already doing that through their community Wi-Fi business. And so if you, if you just look at what they're doing in Mexico, as Eugene described, they, it, they already have a profitable business that beams, you know, satellite connectivity to a central, uh, basically little ground station. And, and then that, that, that Wi-Fi is then dispersed, you know, at the town square where people can actually use it. And these are people who have never had connectivity before. So, you know, calling it the ultimate ESG, um, you know, stock is, a, is a, I think, a little bit overstated. But the truth of the matter is, you read all these articles about, oh, look, look at these great companies trying to connect people. Viaset is already doing that. And so they have, they have a pilot in Brazil. They have a business in Mexico. They're already doing North Africa. When the two satellites come out in EMEA and APAC, there's going to be an opportunity to connect millions, if not billions of people who, through their community Wi-Fi business, that have never had connectivity before, right? So it's, if you believe that a good way to raise people out of poverty, a good way for people to be connected to the world is to have internet connection, um, then Biosat is, you know, a really good social sustainability company. And, you know, it will also be a good business model for them because what, what they're trying to do is they're trying to fill up the capacity. And so, I think one of the things, and, and Eugene's kind of touched on this, but one of the things that people are always looking for is they're looking for some silver bullet. They're like, well, what's the one thing you're going to do to fill up the capacity? With Viasat, it's everything. So they're putting up these three Viasat three satellites, one over North America, one over APAC, and one over EMEA. Um, APAC and EMEA, our sense is that they're going to be heavily weighted towards the military. If you just think about what our mili- U.S. military cares about, they care about what's going on in the Middle East and North Africa, and they care about what's happening in the Pacific. And so, listen, there's not going to be any Starlink with base stations, base stations in China. You're not going to put physical base stations in China. So you have to have a high throughput sat- geo satellite if you want connectivity to our troops or our, um, you know, our Marines or our Navy in the Pacific, right? And so the military, our sense is that it's going to take up a fair amount of the capacity in, in those satellites. But then there are just so many other ways to win, right? There's global in-flight Wi-Fi, which we haven't talked about. Um, so Eugene already, you know, made the joke about GoGo and how bad it is. Um, you know, if you fly uh, uh, JetBlue right now, you'll see a better experience than is anyone else is offering with with the Viasat service. But that's let's let's be clear. That's the Viasat two satellite. When the Viasat three satellite is up in early 2022, you're going to see much better in flight Wi-Fi, and it's going to just my our sense is that whatever Global Eagle and GoGo can offer, it's going to be not even anywhere near. Um, you know, what Viasat can offer. But then when EMEA and APAC are up as well, those satellites, you're going to have global connectivity. So you're going to be able to fly from New York to Tokyo, and you're going to have connectivity, hopefully the whole time, you know, obviously there could be intermittent outages, but you're going to have, when, when, when the APAC satellites up, you're going to be able to have connectivity the whole time. That is a business that doesn't exist today. No one who, who's flying from LA to Tokyo right now has connectivity. Right. And so that's if you, when you think about the TAM expanding Viasat as, as you know, it feel the dreams. So like if you build connectivity through in-flight Wi-Fi that's global, people will come. And so when you have in-flight Wi-Fi, you have some rural broad, broadband and you have the military and then you have community Wi-Fi. Our sense is that they're going to have no issues filling up this capacity because use cases are going to be a come that, that, that haven't existed yet. And people who have never been connected will will, will be connected. And, and, and you talk, you asked us a question, it's like, well, is all this capacity coming out? I mean, I just read the charter call today. I mean, they're talking about, they're like some of their, some of their, I think the average user for charter fixed broadband is like 700 gigs um, a month. And then there are, you know, and, and a lot of their users are now using over a thousand gigs a month. I mean, it is, it is unbelievable the, the demand for bandwidth. And where's that coming from? It's coming from video. It's coming from gaming. I mean, think about it. People used to be watching TV. Now they're not. Now they're streaming everything. And you can't stream if you don't have an internet connection. And so what that's doing, and video is a high, takes a lot of bandwidth. 
So we just think that the total addressable market for and, and, and demand for bandwidth is growing so much faster than, than any amount of capacity that Viasat can build. And can I just add, a, sorry, Trey, just one real quick, just some numbers behind it. And what we've been made a great point about the in-flight uh, connectivity um, uh, opportunity. So right now, Viasat serves about 13, 1,380 planes, I think. Um, I, actually, not all of them are in service for COVID reasons, yes. Um, but when before COVID, uh, at 1,380 planes, I believe that that business are roughly, they don't disclose it, but I, you know, I backed into it, about 200 million in revenue. And they currently in their backlog have enough to effectively almost double that, okay? In their backlog, I'm saying with their Delta wins, with some of the KLM wins that they've had, some of the more international players, when they go internationally and do transatlantic, trans-Pacific flights, those customers are sometimes two to four times more valuable than a domestic U.S. customer, okay? So the actual addressable market for in-flight connectivity could be, I'm, you know, I'm going to, you know, the moonshot would be a billion dollars, but I don't even think it's a moonshot because honestly, you're talking about that's probably six and a half thousand tails, 6,000 tails. And they're, they're already on track to get to two and a half thousand from what we can see today. And that's without the APAC connectivity in, in place. And that's without most of the, you know, African subcontinent, African continent in place and without any of the Indian Ocean passages. So, I mean, I, the the actual numbers here are so immense that um, that's the actual the true business case for Viasat to continue to build the, these things. And I will add that for the equivalent consumer, I would rather have a thousand tails than uh, than half a million uh, consumers. The reason why those thousand tails tails meaning sorry so meaning planes sorry okay. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, so if, uh, a, a thousand planes. I'd rather have that than four or five hundred thousand consumers because those four to five hundred thousand consumers have a na natural churn of about th two and a half to three and a half percent. The planes have zero. So the actual cost to get the same profitability, the profitability levels for in flight Wi Fi are that much greater than having a consumer broadband business. And I, and by the way, uh, Starlink and Elon, they know this. Um, they're not, they're not going to just let other people take this market. They will get there eventually, I believe. Um, I think they'll be a longer. It's going to be it'll take them longer than 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 I think they think. They have to have uh, they have to have FCC or sorry. Um, FAA clearances to get their equipment on board. They actually, don't I don't think they have a, a air mobile ready antennas currently developed. Um, but anyway, so so the, the point is like for for the addressable market for Viasat and their their growth trajectory on the flight connectivity side itself could make this company into a you know a, you know call it a five billion dollar or six billion dollar and it entity just by itself without having any of the military or commercial aero side. So our commercial um, um, our residential side. Wow. Amazing point. Let's talk a little bit about the risks involved because you mentioned all of this capacity coming online and all of, I mean, you mentioned Starlink's tens of thousands, I think you said 40,000 satellites going up into space. You know, my tiny human brain is making this assumption like that sounds like a lot of satellites and that's going to clutter our skies and, you know, there's inherent risks to that. Um, you know, if I step back, it's probably like, you know, space is infinite. The world is very large. That's probably negligible in the grand scheme of things. Is there any risk to putting this much material up into our, you know, stratosphere basically? Well, it depends who you talk to. So, uh, obviously Starlink and Kuiper, um, they say no with a caveat, the, the caveat being you need to have good, uh, what they con consider space junk, um, you know, management schemes, and you need to have a good like collision avoidance systems and be really good at tracking things. Um, and just to clarify though, for, for your uh, listeners, so Elon has, uh, I think 4,400 is the FCC okay number. It, it's not 40,000. So he wants to eventually get there, but um, that 
will take another round of regulatory approvals and years and years of study and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I, I think for what he can accomplish today, it'll still be very impressive, but it's not going to be 40,000. Uh, one of the things that people pushed back on them on was like, well, if there's a collision, uh, you might actually cause this cascading effect of, of just destruction in space, because if you can't, you know, um, if you have so many things crossing the domino orbit, effect, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You, you might actually, you, uh, and this is, it's, it's a Kepler syndrome, a Kessler syndrome, sorry. Um, and uh, there's actually a term for it where a, a satellite that's out of control that causes colli a, one collision can actually cause an infinite number of collisions. And then that space junk that is left behind that you can't control anymore will basically make the, that band of, 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 uh, of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the the Earth's atmosphere inoperable for all satellite connectivity uh, or solutions in general, which would be really really bad because you know it's not just about SpaceX, right? We have the International Space Station there. We have um, you know various other countries have their own satellites, whether it's spy satellites or whatever it may be, um, orbiting there. So you have to think about the world, not just yourself. So there there's certainly um, you know there are risks there, but you know, at least our FCC has deemed it. Uh, irrelevant when it comes to Starlink because they uh, literally this week approved the 4,400 um, to go up. And so that will happen. Uh, I mean, there are, there are many other, I think, risks in general. And, you know, I, this hasn't, you know, it, the, the 4,400, once it operates for a couple of years, and, and if they can show that it's safe, then I think the, the regulators may relax a little bit. Um, but I think up until that point, you know, you still have, I'm going to guess, four to five years before they uh, allow him to do anything more than what they have right now on the docket. All right. And I've heard you talk about the government side of the business for Viaset and that it could make up as much as $46 a share just on its own. You know, and obviously the stock's currently just in the low 50. So that's a lot. That's the majority of the, sh the share price right now. But, you know, I'm curious how, you know, the assumption sounds like Starlink is not going to come after that business, mainly because Viasat has this really long standing relationship with the government and that its encryption technology is very strong. But all of those things sound like kind of, I mean, if I'm thinking about Elon Musk and his relationship with the government, as well as his ability in the, to you know, create encryption in other ways or advanced technology in other ways, that doesn't sound that defensible to me if he's coming after it. Is there, do you guys look at him as a risk for coming after that government business at all? I mean, he, uh, I don't think that he's going to go into the hardware side. Uh, <laughs> there's actually a ton the moat there is is much greater than I could even possibly describe because it's not just like you're making hardware, right? Because you're going into a highly regulated environment where uh, you have to have NSA type one certifications for a lot of the equipment. So these aren't like, oh, let me just slap together something and, you know, uh, commercial off the shelf it and voila, you know, I have a, a government contract. These are, these are, boxes that have been pre-cleared and tested with uh, a lot of the alphabet agencies and, and NSA being the, the primary one that allow for hardened, uh, you, know, uh, you know, jam resistant communications in the middle of war. And trust me, the military doesn't move quickly when it comes to changing over providers because, uh, you know, if someone's coming along saying like, I can do this better because in the end you have to prove that you can operate in that hostile environment. And what Viaset has is three decades worth of proving that they're able to operate in those hostile environments within a, a uh, you know, an encryption, decryption and compression algorithm that um, allows for high, incredibly high throughput uh, amounts of data to go through, uh, you know, the typical warfighter's hands. Um, I, I'm not worried, I, I don't, I, I would put the chances of him getting to the product space at zero. Um, I think obviously connectivity, there's going to be a, a, a again, I, I don't want people to think like I'm, I'm naysaying um, Starlink in, in any way. I, I do believe wholeheartedly that he will provide some connectivity for certain government solutions going forward. Um, again, just from the GAO report, I mentioned it's, a, it's 4 billion today, right? That market. So again, 
is there can Viaset win 20% of it and get 800 million revenue from their current 275? I think so. Can can SpaceX, you know, get their share? I also think so. There's enough here to go around, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And in the end, they serve different use cases. And that's really important to understand. You know, uh, again, if you're a geostationary provider and they need connectivity for whatever reason, you know, uh, in the middle of uh, the Southeast, you know, South China Sea, uh, I'm going to guess that you're going to get the call and not the Leo person because the Leo doesn't have secured, uh, um, I guess, offload points or no gateways that the DOD would trust. Um, I know people's like, oh, well, he's going to put, you know, floating barges in the middle of the Pacific. Okay, you try to sell that to an admiral who's like, wait a minute, I'm going to be reliant on something that could be sunk with a submarine. Uh, how, explain that to me again. So anyway, there, there are a lot of advantages that Vice has, has um, to, to protect itself from the defense side. And honestly, they're just, they're dropping the bucket right now when it comes to the connectivity revenue uh, from the DOD. And, and I, I, I still believe people totally miss that point. They completely don't understand how competitively uh, positioned they are um, for the future, you know, with the caveats and being that they need to have the, the global uh, satellite uh, network up. So those two uh, ones that, that come. After and that's the, the Viasat 3 Correct. constellation. Yeah. And, and when is the debut of that? Like when is the, when should we expect that to be in the sky? Uh, the first one, which goes over in North and South America, effectively the, Amer- the America satellite um, comes up in, well, the launch should be, they say Q1 calendar, Q1 of 2022. So call it, you know, it's eight months from now, seven to eight months from now. And then um, you should start seeing revenue within, you know, uh, 12 months. And, and, and in your opinion, the market is just not pricing that in. Uh-huh. No, not at all. In fact, this has been the history of Vice at stock. You know, we've, we've owned this in different sizes for, for six years. And we, in between the first satellite and the second satellite, there was a lull actually caused by SpaceX because SpaceX was going to be the launch provider for Vice at two. And then if you guys recall, they had an issue with a couple of the rockets blowing up. And so they canceled all launches for like four months when the, until they f- figure out what was going on with the rocket systems, which caused this massive backlog in, uh, of satellite uh, companies who had to be pushed to the very back of uh, someone else's line. So I said it contracted it out with Ariane Space to do their second launch and had to wait an extra year and a half effectively. So, and, and then that lull, right? I mean, people in the sh- that's when the sh- initial shorts came out and Carousel did a great piece and, and you know, attacked it at exactly the right time. And people said, oh my God, this, this, this is a terrible, company you know they'll never grow because the rural broadband is getting eaten by 4g and whatever the 4g was the boogeyman back then and so you know there you know we suffered for two years looked like idiots and then the satellite was launched and revenue started increasing and the cash flow started coming through and all of a sudden they went into the 90s and i think the same thing is happening right now really i mean it's just you know uh starlink is the new boogeyman but that boogeyman is much scarier because he has a better, much better PR. Um, and, and so, the, you know, I think we believe that there is a, a good buy point even today for someone who has, you know, longer than a two quarter time horizon and can wait out the volatility. Uh, we believe that they will be rewarded with, with a much higher stock within the next two years. Got it. And, you know, Gwen Shaw, well, I was mentioning the CEO of, Star, of SpaceX, has mentioned that you know obviously their core focus with Starlink is consumer based, but she also mentioned that you know while SpaceX might not be a a company that makes sense to go public, Starlink could be meaning they could spin that off potentially and take Starlink public. So I have to ask if that were to happen, is that a stock that you guys would be looking at pretty closely and, and even investing in? Uh, it depends on what the price is. I mean, we're, we're cheapskates and the value guys, uh, you know, we have a problem with uh, cracking open, open the wallet and paying for growth. Um, I, I will say that I, I almost guarantee you that if, if Starlink were to go pu- uh, public, um, there would be an immediate long short trade where people would go long Starlink and short uh, the traditional 
providers, which unfortunately I think why I said would be lumped into that mix. It would be to people's detriment, but I think that that would be the natural thing that uh, someone would do. Um, I highly doubt that they'll do this in terms of the separating it out because, you know, I, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I, I like Elon and his like, you know, I guess his, his chutzpah, you know, his ability to, to like just make things, will things to happen. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, I think one of his core beliefs is he needs to go to Mars. He can't raise the money to go to Mars without Starlink as part of SpaceX. No one's going to give SpaceX money to go build a cool little, you know, rocket ship to go take right. Starlink is his AWS kind of exactly, feature. Exactly, exactly. I think Starlink is going to fund his other adventures in space. And I think he totally understands that point. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why they would separate out the companies. It doesn't make sense from a fundraising perspective. Um, so anyway, so that's, this is, this is I'll a, also yeah. jump in there just quickly and say, we there's no way Starlink is making money right now. Now that does, hasn't stopped anybody from going public, especially if there's a SPAC involved. But I mean, j let's just think about it this way. It, for their, to, to be a Starlink subscriber, it is like, like $99 a month and then $500 for the dish. We've seen estimates for the dish that you put on your house of you know two to $3,000 in costs. So they're selling it to you for 500 and they're paying two to $3,000 just for that. Plus their cost of their satellites, which we haven't even talked about is astronomical as it is, especially as it like on a per bit basis compared to what Biosat can get, you know, can get for, as the, for, the, for the Biosat three constellation. So my guess is that Starlink is bleeding. And, and now, I mean, just like with, with Biosat, there will be an inflection point at some point um, if they get enough enough band, enough enough users well let's but, talk about let's talk about that and, and not making money right because and let's talk about the viasat financials because they are also not making earnings at the moment and their free cash flow has been pretty abysmal and i don't know if that has to do with the acquisition you mentioned but talk us through how we should think through viasat's financials and where the earnings are going to turn around yeah. So looking at the income statement is difficult. Um, I think you have to focus on the cash flow statement. And, and, and as Eugene always says, you have to look at cash flow from operations because they're going to continue to spend on satellite CapEx because Mark Dankberg and the team see this gigantic opportunity to basically revolutionize, again, the geostationary world and to, as we've talked about, increase the total addressable market um, by, by, by providing connectivity that didn't used to exist. So right now we are literally near the bottom of their financials because in-flight Wi-Fi has been crushed by COVID, right? Nothing having to do with them. They've been spending a ton on R&D to, 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 to finish the Biosat 3 constellations. And I guess they're already spending a little bit on Biosat 4. But you know, if you just think about a satellite, you build it and you look the most levered and the least profitable the day before it launches. And then it launches and you get to reap the benefits. So it's just like a piece of real estate, right? You build a building, right? And you have all this debt and you have no revenue until you start to lease it up. So think about that. And so basically um, over the next you know, 18 to 24 months, they're gonna launch three satellites. They've already spent the majority of the CapEx for the Viasat 3 constellation. And so you're going to see a cash flow inflection point happen um, in our estimation very quickly. And, and so here's what's really important about that is that with just Viasat 1 and Viasat 2 up, they weren't particularly self-funding, right? They would have to take on debt in order to build a Viasat 3 complex. Now, when those three satellites are up and if they're as successful as we think they can be, Viasat will be self-funding from then on and will be able to fund the, the Viasat, you know, the, the four constellation over time without taking on equity or debt. They've just been a little bit subscale because remember, as Eugene said, this this was this they got into the connectivity business in in the you know the, the early like 2011, right? This they, this was a core military encryption company until Mark Dankberg decided he that they that they thought they could completely disintermediate the traditional um, geo world, and so some of they, they I think they benefit significantly from having more scale, more total free cash flow. Um, to be able to fund whatever adventures, whether that's a Leo constellation for the government, whether it's their own Leo constellation for, for, for consumer broadband, they're gonna have the cash flow. But our point is that you're just not going to see it right this moment. And so until 
this really, as Eugene said, people underestimate, have underestimated Mark Dankworth at every turn, like they have to Elon, with Elon to some degree. But you're going to see in our estimation, the cash flows turn around, the leverage come down, and the profitability rise significantly as these satellites are launched. And that's going to, in our estimation, change people's perception of the stock. I hate to even bring it up, but it seems like a key indicator these days is Kathy Wood, and she's launched a space ETF recently, but Viasat's not included. Why, why do you think that is? Kathy has bad analysts. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't Actually, I sent her an email being like, hey, curious, um, why leave out a couple of people and, and Viasat being one of them? I mean, she has things like you know, Raven Industries, which we've owned before, and um, I would say uh, uh, stretching for this <laughs> connection to space. It would be Netflix, it, for example. Yeah, Netflix I, is a space company. I, I, I mean, I, I, I understand the. I think their their point was like, well, things that will benefit again from more connectivity. I, I get where they're coming from, but I think it's you know whatever. I, I don't want to talk about Arc really because I, I don't I don't know. Um, how they decide on what goes in there or, or what doesn't. Um, what I can, I mean, the only thing I could really say to people is that if you want to, you know, if, if you were to create a portfolio of, let's say, uh, you know, there's going to be a space, you know, a spot for geostationary satellites and it's going to be a spot for Leo, Leo satellites. Uh, if I want the best in class geostationary player, I would buy Viasat, and if I want to balance that with the best in class Leo player, I would, you know, if Starlink was public. I would buy Starlink, and that would be my 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 space portfolio. And everyone else, I don't care about because those two entities have competitive advantages that that other people don't have, and they're going to crush them in the end. So I think that that would be my 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 own Kathy Wood portfolio and how I would have positioned it. Well, this is what I love about you guys, because, you know, of all the value investors I know, I mean, you guys are in these trenches and I've just loved watching you guys with Lumen and now with Viasat. I mean, these are companies like if, if I use my own tool on, on our TIP finance website, you know, it's not very compelling, right? The free cash flows on this thing are pretty negative and without doing a ton of research as, like you guys have, it's not something I would even probably consider, but you guys seem to be well positioned for these turnaround moments where these things like you mentioned unlocking the value and that's really what it is it's this game of you know with value investing right is we're doing this research to unlock this hidden value that the market isn't seeing and so i take what you i take your opinion with a uh uh you know a, a, i really highly weight your opinion especially you eugene because you have so much experience with this co company in particular but with all that said i have to wonder how your experience might bias your opinion on this, right? I mean, you might, you're very close to this company. And I'm wondering what would convince you guys on the flip side of buying, you know, what would convince you guys to sell Viasat? What would you see and be looking for to say, okay, this is the time to let it go? Yeah, that's a great, I think that's a fantastic question. Uh, and I, I will spend some time plugging Coast Street because I think it's a great segue because you know, we have a robust, um, we call it the devil's advocate process. So uh, typically a position has two longs and one short and, and we assign people sh the short. So you have to come up with, you know, every single reason under the sun that our key variables on the long side will not be, you know, will, will not happen. And you have to bring, you know, evidence-based uh, data to back up your assertions, right? And so, Luckily, in, in Viasat's case, there's it's not too long one short. It's, it's only one long, and then everyone else short. So I, I'm I'm 150 percent aware of my own ingrained bias. I do, you know, I, I'm the first one to admit. So you you know you, you I think you describe yourself as a Elon fanboy. I'm a Mark Dankberg fanboy because I worked for the man and I understand the culture within Viasat. I love that company. I truly do. Um, you know, I. I I have nothing but good things to say about it. And I, the first person to admit that I am a hundred percent biased, you know, and, and I will defend it. Um, but I'm also not, um, I, I understand the, the tunnel vision that I, you know, may be sub subject to. And so I look for this confirming evidence and that's the key. You can be a fanboy, but as long as you look for this, this confirming evidence, 
that's how you maintain rational sanity. And, and Ben and, and Jeff and Andrew, uh, another one of our colleagues, they keep me grounded because constantly, I, and, and Viasat's one of these stocks, you know, I get three to five emails every week from these guys saying like, Hey, do you look at, you know, look, did you look at this? Do you look at, you know, this is what Ars Technica is saying. Oh, look, look, they just did a breakdown of the, you know, the dish. And, and so um, your question was when, what would cause us to sell the stock? It's a fantastic question. I will say that over the course of the last two years, what's really changed is I took the probability of you know Elon's success from like a thirty percent chance to a hundred, and I adjusted our um, our model, the assumptions of like residential broadband growth and revenue contribution from it accordingly, right? Because again, I, I don't want to I don't want to have my head in the sand. I mean, this man is doing great things. He's literally building a massive network that has never been seen from scratch and he's there he's already built it it's not building he's built it so i don't want to be you know saying like oh well you know that's not going to affect my asset of course it will i mean that that is, you would be a maniac to say that it, it, there won't be some knock-on effects right and so it's certainly within the, res the residential broadband span, uh, space there will be and and i think we've you know, in our in our in our adjusted expectations of encapsulated that, um, and the guys that I have are, are at Cove help me um, with, you know, poking holes at my own thesis, right, or my my own premise, uh, and and that's one of the core things that we do here internally is to make sure that there's no expert fallacy and there's no expert bias because we really hate it when you know there's you know the, the firm sometimes firms have like the whatever analyst right the telecom analyst the healthcare analyst and then everyone in the room just turns to them and say okay well, well what do you think that's not how we run cove and that's not how what we do for diligence and that's not how we make decisions um and, and it, like what would you know when would we sell it you know there's always a price right i mean i i think it is a compounder i think every single day it gets more valuable but you know if you told me like if i woke up tomorrow and and what I don't know something happened and then all of a sudden it's worth two hundred dollars a share. I don't know. I mean, we're small cap investors. It's probably inappropriate for us to own something that's fifteen billion or twenty billion dollars anyway. So that's one way that it, that it exits the portfolio. Another way is you know we are shown that through through data, right, factual data that we are incorrect in our assumptions on in-flight Wi-Fi growth that we are incorrect in our assumptions on the defense side growth, and we are incorrect in our assumptions on their defensibility in the residential broadband. If that starts happening, I'm gonna be like, okay, totally wrong, I'm sorry, you know, uh, apologize to our clients and take, take our medicine. Um, but until that happens, until that the data comes in that disconfirms what we believe to be the growth trajectory here, uh, there is no reason to sell it because again, I, I really do believe this is a compounding machine. It's not a gram, it's not a point to point trade. Uh, ben, I don't know if you have any. No, I mean, we keep Eugene on his toes. I mean, <laughs> every, I mean, this, is, this is our second largest position in the strategy that I co-manage. Um, every day I'm looking for disconfirming evidence and for sure, there's a lot of hype out there that is suggestive that Elon is going to eat everybody's lunch. And as we've said over and over again, we think that there, there's room for multiple people to be successful. But when you focus on the hype, what you do is you miss the nuance. And the nuance is that what we started with, that Viasat is going to be an in-flight Wi-Fi and military-oriented company in three to five years. And, and that is plenty for, for us to have a much higher stock price. And from here, it's just patience. And, um, you know, could some things happen in the intervening period? Absolutely, we will take that data um, and, and, and the price of the stock and consider it. But I look at this as, as a, a multi-bagger in the sense that, you know, we're value investors. What we usually do is we look at what is and we value what is and we don't bake in anything for the future. And we hope that we're buying the, you know, growth for free because it's trading at a discount to intrinsic value on what is today. I think with buy side, you have to look around the corner and people are just not great. And then you could look at something like you know, whether it's Amazon 
or Shopify or some of these businesses that have just created their own TAMs that people couldn't couldn't even you know imagine 10 years earlier. You have to look around the corner and you have to skate to where the puck is going. And where the puck is going is more use cases, more demand, um, and and in, in, and and incumbents who have legacy assets that will not be competitive in 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 24 months. And that's that's it. And 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 why wouldn't this be a forever stock? Um, and that's that's kind of the way we look at it. Well, you you touched on one of the reasons to sell might be potentially uh, one reason that I I love referencing, which is getting tomorrow's price today, right? So let's talk a little bit about that and close out there with your sort of overall intrinsic value assumption, or even your. The discount rate, you know, the IRR you're looking for with this stock and and where it kind of sits relative to today. Because as we mentioned, the stock is in the low 50s at the time of recording, but it's been as high as 100, right? So it's it, it it's not a reasonable thing it can go much higher from here, even though it's had a decent run up to date. So what is the um what's the yield you're estimating out of this particular pick and and how, yeah, how is it relative to the stock today? Yeah, we think of the uh typically underwrite things in three-year chunks. Um, the really annoying thing here is a COVID, um, besides the in-flight Wi-Fi issue, it delayed the launch by now it's coming up to almost a year. Um, supply chain issues because people are just literally not being able to be at work um, or, you know, getting sick. And so having to close down the, the you know, their, their clean rooms and things like that. Um, it's just, and it's also the supply chain was disrupted. I mean, it, it really delayed things immensely. Um, but from here, if we just assume a normal cadence and them launching this, the EMEA one six months after the this first America's one, and then the APEC one another six to nine months after the EMEA one, um, we believe that over the next three years, you could see a upside of somewhere between 120 and 150 dollars a share. Um, the intermediate level, I would say, uh, I don't, we don't typically talk about. We won't talk like this internally, but uh, for your listeners, uh, once the America's One is launched and the um, revenue profile starts adjusting to the new revenue opportunities that they've set up for the America's One. Um, we believe that the intermediary stock will be in the 80s, um, and then uh, you know you will get the the full upside over the next year and a half after that, um, following the EMEA launch because EMEA that revenue will be de novo revenue, meaning like uh, they have America's revenue right now, right? And so whatever they can get is is, is additional revenue on the America side, which you can argue like, well, you know, let's say. They're not going to get as much on residential and they're just going to be defensive. It'll be, it won't be actual real grower, which I think are up here points. Um, but on the EMEA side, it will literally be like brand new, like, you know, oh my God, they all of a sudden you wake up and they have an extra 250 million of revenue flowing through. And then, you know, you, you'll see the, the bump up in, in cash flow from operations. And then that's actually the inflection point. Um, you'll start seeing them generate free cash flow. And I think once that happens, it'll, it'll solve the problem of what everyone points out, which is, hey, look, these guys, they've been, you know, building these things. That's fantastic. But how do we know that they're actually successful? Because in the end, there's been no free cash flow generated. And I think once the me one is up, uh, the CapEx should normalize somewhere around six to eight hundred million dollars is our assumption. And you will start generating a de decent amount of free cash flow and it'll actually deliver and allow them to do other things. Um, um, whether it's add on the acquisitions or, or you know, they're returning it, uh, cash flow to shareholders in some way. So I think that's kind of, um, you know, the, the progression of the upside uh, that we're assuming. Fantastic. Well, Ben, Eugene, I always enjoy talking with you guys and digging in deep on these picks because it's just fascinating. And I mean, there's just something so exciting about this race for space we're witnessing and alive for today. And I, I, I'm going to really enjoy the, the progress of both Starlink and Viasat. So I want to, before we let you go, I want to make sure we give a handoff to Cove Street, any of your social platforms or any other resources you guys want to highlight. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, um, we, we definitely are out there. 
we're not some opaque hedge fund that doesn't talk about our positions. We're happy, as, as we talked about with Lumen with you and Biosat here. Um, so if you go to our website, site, copestreetcapital.com, and go to our thoughts tab, you can see any number of interviews and discussions that Eugene have had, uh, Eugene and I have had. Um, if you're, you know, if you're on Twitter, you can, I've, I've reemerged um, on Twitter over the last uh, six months, and um, you can find me, the inoculated investor. Um, I'm pretty active on, on Twitter as well. Um, but, you know, we, we are, we approach everything with a fair amount of humility, and we understand that with both Lumen and Viasat, we are making very contrarian statements that other people may have, you know, very applicable and, you know, coherent questions about. And so we're always happy for people's feedback. So reach out to us, um, you know, find us on the website and reach out to us if you have feedback or questions, because we're always interested in people's perspective, especially if they, you know, they, they, you know, they know these companies or these industries well, we will, we will incorporate our, you know, their information into our own, our own mosaic as well. All right, gentlemen, thank you again for coming on the show. Hope to do it again soon. Thank you, Trey. Really appreciate the time. Yep. Cheers. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.